Recently I made a video about induction cooking and towards the end of that video I had originally intended to briefly analyze the energy aspects such as climate impact and energy costs and national security and so on. But I quickly realized that it was sounding extremely similar to the analysis at the end of the electric faucet video. This is perhaps unsurprising since they're both examples of electrification, so why not just make a video about electrification in general and cover all of these appliances? Well that's what I'm here to do today, so hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size and there are many reasons to electrify, but the one that you've probably heard about the most, especially in recent years, is fighting climate change. So does induction cooking, for instance, actually fight climate change? Well, according to my calculations, which you can see on screen right now, in order for induction cooking to have a lower climate impact per meal than gas cooking, your electricity supply would need to be cleaner than about 460 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. For most countries, and in Europe especially, the average carbon intensity of electricity is already below that value. But many people will argue that average electricity is very different from marginal electricity, and that's true. Obviously, nuclear power plants are already producing as much as they can. Hydroelectric power plants are producing as much as they have water to produce. Wind and solar are producing as much as they feel like at any given moment, and stuff like waste incinerators are producing as much as they must in order to get all the waste incinerated. There aren't actually a lot of power plants that can dynamically respond to changes in electricity demand, and the ones that can are usually coal or gas power plants. This means that every time you add a new load to the grid, the extra electricity is probably going to be provided by a coal or gas power plant, and so the vast majority of the time, the carbon intensity of that electricity is going to be above the 460 gram threshold. And this is all true, but what we're missing here is that in the medium and long term, the grid always gets greener. The extra demand which is supplied from coal or gas in the near term is going to open the door to a corresponding amount of wind and solar in the medium and long term. In my first ever video, I presented calculations that showed that with the newly released prices for the Tesla Mega Pack, you can make a solar plus storage power plant which can use the batteries to average out the production as if it were a baseload plant, and still be cheaper than a coal power plant. Shortly after I published that video, we got news of an actual power company building an actual installation just like the one I had theorized using actual Tesla Mega Packs to replace an actual coal power plant. This was significant news at the time, but in just a few short years, we're getting similar announcements pretty much every other week or so. And of course, this kind of arrangement is only going to work in the summertime, but in the wintertime, the batteries can simply buffer the production of wind turbines, which on a seasonal basis is almost perfectly complementary to solar in most geographies. And the reason I explained all of that is to give you an idea of how it actually happens when we say that the grid gets greener over time. Right now we have affordable and even profitable technologies which have the ability to take the grid to near complete decarbonization once fully deployed. This means that my induction hubs are getting greener over time without me doing anything, but my gas stove is always going to require gas. At a very high level, decarbonization is dead simple. It's literally just two steps. Electrify everything and decarbonize electricity. But both of these steps are pretty much non-negotiable and that's why you keep hearing so much about both of them. And of course, if you had rooftop solar paired with a home battery, that would get the decarbonization job done immediately, at least for most of the year. But if you can't get solar, well, as far as the climate is concerned, that's fine. You simply need to electrify and the grid is going to eventually handle the decarbonization part for you. And just like decarbonization is often profitable, Electrification itself can be profitable in its own right, regardless of where your electricity is coming from. 
Profit is, I think, the second most common reason why people electrify. Natural gas is usually four times cheaper than grid electricity and about 30% cheaper than rooftop solar electricity. But if you've watched my electric faucets video, you'll know that by virtue of not being grossly oversized for the task, like the combi boiler is, the faucets use seven to eight times less energy for the same task. So even if the kind of energy energy they use is up to four times more expensive, they're still turning a massive profit. This is similar to how electric cars gain their operational savings. People never appreciate just how small EV batteries are. The biggest ones store the equivalent of about two gallons of gasoline, maybe two and a half, and they travel up to 500 miles on that energy. So even if electricity is more expensive than gasoline, electric vehicles still cost less per trip because they use so little energy. The fact just is that the elegance of electricity allows for very clever and very resourceful devices that combustion never managed to enable. Now with the induction cooker it's not quite like that. While it does use only half the energy, grid electricity is four times as expensive as natural gas. So when you run the numbers, which again I'll show on screen, the calculations show that I'm spending about $20 more per dweller per year than I would be spending if I was cooking on gas. If I had solar panels, I would be saving about $5 instead. However, as we've seen in the induction cooktop video, these two are not quite equivalent products, because if I were to spend the money on all the equipment necessary in order to operate a gas stove while maintaining the same level of indoor air quality as when cooking on induction, that would cost at least hundreds of dollars. So overall it would take a very long time for my induction setup to actually cost more. This again shows the elegance that's possible with electric appliances. Not only is the cooking experience better in general, but it can be performed without the insane levels of indoor air pollution that combustion would produce. So I can get away with much cheaper ventilation hardware and still be perfectly fine. This also happens to be a good example for the third reason to electrify and that's to reduce air pollution. There's not really a lot to say on this point other than what you can learn from my deep dive into air pollution. But to summarize it, all combustion produces air pollution, there are many different kinds of air pollution ranging from slightly unhealthy to incredibly toxic, and all of them can be managed, but it's difficult. It's especially difficult to manage them on small appliances as opposed to on huge power plants and even the state of the art in flue gas cleaning technology is not incredibly efficient. Electrification even on its own allows us to take the sources of air pollution, concentrate them into large centralized facilities that have the necessary scale to utilize the state of the art and then we can place these centralized facilities 30 to 100 kilometers away from population centers. All of this can be done with just electrification, but if we also perform the second step which is to decarbonize the electricity, air pollution will be almost entirely gone. But taking a bit of a step backwards from that, the fourth benefit of electrification is energy security on a national level. And this comes from the fact that electrification offers optionality. If I have a gas cooker, that's always going to require a natural gas supply, but if I have an induction cooker, that can run on electricity made from gas, or coal, or oil, or nuclear, or hydro, or geothermal, or wind, or solar, or waste incineration, or biomass. Anything that can make electricity can power my induction cooking, but combustion appliances are usually much more limited. For a real life example, we can take a look at 2022 in the European Union. While coal and gas electricity both gained market share in that year, the gain for coal was significantly larger than for gas. This was achieved by running the operational coal plants at a higher capacity factor. And if gas supplies would have remained tight into 2023, this trend would have continued with old coal units probably being brought back online. LNG made that ultimately unnecessary, but the point was proven. Electricity offers optionality. 
With a combustion economy, you have to ensure supplies of coal and gas and oil, but with an electrified economy, you can get away with supplying only coal or gas or oil or a bunch of other options. And something that's intertwined with national security, the fifth benefit of electrification is energy independence. This exists not only on a national level, but also on an individual level. Because if all of your appliances run on electricity, this means that they can run on your rooftop solar production. And being 100% self-powered in that way would mean that when your grid gets attacked by terrorists, many areas of the economy would continue operating as normal. And those that wouldn't, for instance if they only produced 80% of their own energy, well most of them would still continue operating only at whatever reduced capacity their self-production allows them to. Especially useful when the terrorists in question can afford enough missiles to target power plants and transmission lines, but cannot afford enough missiles to target everything. Finally, the sixth benefit of electrification, at least as far as I can come up with, is enabling resiliency. This is related to independence, but it's also slightly different from independence. If you remember the Texas freeze, you'll know that if the government fails to mandate proper winterization, then even natural gas pipelines can clog. If your household depends on continued energy supply, that's gonna be a problem. But if your house is very well insulated, that could drop your heating load to something like 3 kilowatts. If your heating is provided by a heat pump, that could further drop the load to only 1 kilowatt of electrical power. And 1 kilowatt is so little that even during a winter storm, most solar installations will still be able to provide that amount. Additionally, if you go into the storm with a filled up home battery, even if you just charged it from the grid in expectation of the storm, that's gonna provide a good buffer, and of course if you have some form of seasonal storage, it's not even a discussion anymore. This is what we call resiliency. And sticking with southeastern USA, if you remember the cyber attack at the Colonial Pipeline, you'll know that gasoline shortages are just as possible as electrical blackouts. But if you have solar panels and storage and an electric vehicle, well, that's resiliency. So to wrap it all up, when you electrify, you eliminate the majority of air pollution, you often get climate benefits, you often save money, you increase national security, and you open a path towards complete decarbonization of energy, since electricity is the only form of energy that can be reasonably decarbonized. When you go further and also decarbonize electricity, you gain even more climate benefits, you eliminate pretty much all air pollution, you save even more money on a society level, you increase national security even further, and if you perform your decarbonization by leveraging distributed power generation, you increase national security even further, your citizens save a lot more money, and the individuals gain resiliency. So with the energy discussion done, this pretty much wraps up my thoughts on induction cooking. But it does not wrap up my thoughts on air pollution, which means I still have some more videos planned about that. To make sure you don't miss those, I recommend hitting the subscribe button, and until next time, thank you for watching.